Welcome everyone to uh, our sixth webinar episode of Thriving at Junietta. Uh, my name is Matthew Damshoder, Dean of Students and Vice President for Student Life here at the college. And my great co-host, Avion. <laughs> Sophomore. Yeah, I, didn't, I wasn't expecting this episode. <laughs> um, Avion Clayton, second year engineering physics PLE. And, you know, Matt's, Matt's co-host. I don't have many accolades around here. Oh, that's a lie. That's a lie. Uh, you were chosen for very good reasons. Go back to past episodes. You'll find out all, all the good reasons. <laughs> uh, in any case, uh, we are glad to be with you during fall break week uh, on campus. Things are quieting down. Students are departing. Pocket or Parking lots are kind of emptying out. And uh, the break is well-deserved. And uh, and for students who go home or students who, who stay, the days without class are, I think, kind of a blessing. So uh, we're, we're really looking forward to that. And it's an appropriate moment to pause in our semester as we pause in our semester and talk about finances and billing and sort of the deadlines and, and, uh, and expectations that are coming up that emerge in December with the first billing and, and January with you know, families making their spring payments. And so we have some great guests uh, with us as usual. <laughs> um, Tracy Patrick is our director of financial planning and uh, is someone that I work with really closely uh, from the Dean of Students office because students who come through our door are often experiencing, you know, obstacles to, to their continuation. And uh, financial obstacles are one of the more common kinds of things that students encounter. And Lauren Piro is our bursar. Uh, for those of you in the world of, uh, of non-collegiate uh, enterprises, the bursar is the person who kind of helps students manage their accounts and makes payments and sort of keeps track and, uh, and uh, provides those billings. And so Lauren does a great job, I think, working with students and, uh, and uh, is also a good partner in the enterprise. So we're so glad to have you here. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you for having us. <laughs> so uh, it's, I guess, um, October. But, you know, in terms of, you know, that moment when students are on campus, I think families, given how they select and fund and make choices about college, are always kind of thinking about the finances piece. And for first year students in particular moving into the second semester, this will be the next sort of moment when a bill is generated and, uh, and families, you know, pay their, their spring charges. And so... Uh, it might be helpful since it's a first time to kind of think through what are those um, milestones or moments that they can expect to hear, um, you know, from billing or the bursar's office. Absolutely, yeah. So right first is first. Uh, we're basically wrapping up the fall billing. Um, if students have balances, we send out notifications the first last week, um, and they will be due November 1st. And this is a really good time because students go home for fall break, and they talk to their families and say, hey, I still have a balance, you know, and then normally they send the checks back with them when they come back. Um, and, a, and a balance, I mean, you know, it's hard, I think, sometimes to estimate how much those charges are, you know, students incur an extra fee or those kinds of things happen. And, exactly. and so it's really clearing the decks on uh, on that and, and doing so opens the doors for students to register for spring classes, right. to attain mm -hmm. housing. And there are, there are thresholds where, you know, if a student has a particular balance, they can't do those things. Right, absolutely, yeah. Because if there is a balance over $1,000, there is a hold on the student accounts, and that will prohibit them from registering for the spring semester. Um, the spring registration, it opens up October 31st, and it runs until November 26th. So even if they, you know, can't get it paid by October 31st, they still have plenty of time to register before it closes. Okay. Which is good. But in the meantime, mm -hmm. you know, clearing that account yes. or making contact with the birth service office yeah. and, uh, and still moving through the process of registration. And we had Celia Cook Huffman last week to talk about that process. But working with advisors, you know, coming up with courses, all of those things remain important, even if, you know, families are just making a plan on how to, how to clear that account. Yeah. And then what does spring hold for So us? spring hold. <laughs> so spring, basically, we will release the spring bill the first week of December, and it will be due January 6th. Now, say if families don't want to pay it all in full by January 6th, we do offer a payment plan for the spring semester. Okay. Um, so it would basically be six equal payments, and it starts November, and it goes until April. 
So then the parents are probably wondering, well, if it starts in November, I don't have a bill yet, right? Right. But we tell families to basically estimate it based off of fall, so that way they can get on the payment plan so that their monthly payments are smaller rather than waiting until December or January, you know, to enroll. And having to make plan. a bulk, a bulk right. payment. Right. Absolutely. Can be kind yeah. Of challenging. And then you know we can always adjust their budget if they get their bill and it is different. Like say they are going on a trip or something like that. We can increase it. We can decrease it. So if our family contribution is about six thousand dollars, you know, we can just ballpark a thousand dollars a month starting in November, December, January, February. Write that check, send it in, and you know, figure it out on the other end if there's you know change left, you know, to sort of uh, to cover. Yeah. And the nice thing, there's no like interest fees with the payment plan. It's just there's a thirty-five dollar enrollment fee for spring, unless you do the annual plan. If you do fall and spring, it's sixty dollars. All right. Well, that would make a lot of sense for me. I know I'm always sort of scrambling at the end of every month to sort of bridge those days, those last days. Can we get a yellow bill? I'm not looking forward to this at all. I know this isn't my topic because I went to check my balance um, because I got an email and I looked at it and usually whenever I get one, I just forward it, forward it to my mom. What is that? So that I, you get the bill on the arch. Right. Yes. I mean, you have to go in through your system and get it, and then do you email it to your parents? Do you take a picture of it and text it? Like, how do you share that information? I what hit, does that look like? I hit forward. <laughs> or, or oh no, no, no! I'm sorry, that wasn't the right answer. You can set it up so that they can right? see, that yes. your parents can see your your bill as well, oh. and they can get an email. Too. Yeah, that's crucial. Yeah, so the students just need to authorize you as parents, and you'll receive all email notifications from our office. Um, and also, if you want to enroll in the payment plan, you actually do have to be an authorized user if you want. To. The parent to enroll in a payment. I forgot that we're grown, so like we have to give <laughs> the parents. Oh, so like parents yeah. can have direct access to that rather than just depending on their student to sort of push that out to them. That makes a lot of sense. My mom told me um, one day while I was when I was a senior in high school, she said because I was setting up everything, and she said, "Why didn't you authorize me yet?" I said, "Authorize." <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you have the right number, man. Right? And yeah. yet she did. I can't, right I can't authorize you to do anything. I thought this would be established for 18 years. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. That's funny. And I, I relished in that for a little bit. I, I, I had a good time with it. Yeah. Well, one of the processes of financial planning, Tracy, is that you know families know what they should expect to receive in terms of merit aid and grants and scholarships and loans and uh and that really persists through the period of a student's enrollment at Junietta. Uh, but sometimes circumstances change. Right. And can you talk a little bit about how families can communicate that with you or to you and explore options or opportunities if, if circumstances change dramatically? Sure. Um, so keep in mind that every year a family should do the FAFSA. Um, at this point now, you can do the FAFSA for next year already. So starting in October on October 1st. The FAFSA is open to do it for next year's already. It is based on your 2018 taxes. Um, and then every year, student family gets from our office a financial aid award letter, which breaks down all of the grants, scholarships, loans that you're eligible for. And it also gives your net cost of education for the year as well. So that is given to you even before the bills come out. Um, that will remain the same all four years. So typically, if your financial information stays the same, um, if your family finances and your household information stays the same, your aid typically stays the same, with the exception that federal loans increase with grade level. Right. So if something changes, and especially because we use, a, we backdate and use taxes that are actually 2000 if we're using 2018 for the 2021 academic year a lot can change in that time and we call that prior prior yeah that's using when two you... years old data right to kind of inform the decision so that people have more data earlier right and the reason the government did that is because sometimes it was hard to get your tax information done accurately in time so we use two years prior really 2018 information for 20, the academic year 2021. Mm -hmm. um, but if something changes, the first thing you'd want to do is reach out to the financial aid office um, because we often say we can't help you if we don't know things. Right? If we don't mm -hmm. hear from you, we're assuming everything is the same and your aid is going to stay the same. 
But things that you should reach out to us definitely if something changes would be a change in employment. So if someone gets laid off or a job change where their finances decrease dramatically. Um, if a family has um, un unexpected medical expenses that mm -hmm. aren't covered by um, their insurance. So a lot of, I had a family reach out um, in the summer and they had an unexpected family medical uh, issue that we can take that into consideration. We would need some documentation, but that's something you should reach out to us. If parents divorce, that could be, that's a change in your household information. So that's a change in your income and in your household. That's something you should reach out to us. Um, if there's a death in the family, that's definitely something you can reach out to us. If the parents' information is originally on the FAFSA. Um, so those are just some of the things that you definitely want to reach out to us, give us a call or even send us an email and say, I'm not sure if this makes a difference. Things that we can't take into consideration would be, um, we've had families reach out to us in the past that say maybe there was like a natural disaster and they mm -hmm. had a garage, like when your snow fell on a garage and it oh, collapsed the garage. But that's something that insurance covers. So right. obviously we're not going to double dip and say, okay, well, insurance is covering you right. there. So there are times whenever families reach out and we say, no, nah, that probably wouldn't qualify because that's really not reflected on the FAFSA. There's nothing for us to adjust a FAFSA with. Um, but it's helpful to maintain that communication. And, I, you know, we would hope that families wouldn't encounter stressful situations or, you know, encounter those kinds of, uh, of instances. But we know that that does happen. And for students, the financial planning office is rarely the first thing on right. their mind. Right. Uh, and as right. they sort of work through and process the stress associated with stuff going on at home, a lot of times I think they either set aside or avoid or, um, or neglect kind of that outreach when it can be really helpful to have that earlier and, and more right. often. Right. And, ex and even if it's just to have the conversation or if, if parents are not sure, if you're not sure, that's what we're there for. Yeah. You know, it's never hurts to reach out to us and we'll be truthful with you and we'll try to figure out a way if we can to help navigate that, especially when it's something that has drastically changed um, in your household or your finances that oftentimes the government gives us the leeway to, if it is something that we can use our best judgment and help you with. Um, so the best thing to do is reach out to us and especially students, sometimes they, um, they confuse Lauren and I. Sometimes they'll come in to pay a bill to the fund, <laughs> yeah. and we'll have to show them. No, we're not. We give you the money. Lauren's the one who takes, who the, takes money. the money. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. um, but we're always well. You know, we're always there in the enrollment center. Um, so we encourage you and the families to reach out to us. So. Well, I, um, you know, one of the opportunities that we have available to us is study abroad, and there are really rich opportunities for students to engage in, uh, in practices that benefit them over the course of their career and their life and, and their education here. Growing up poor, you know, being a first generation college student, I never thought study abroad would be possible for me. I just thought, you know, the cost of it or the burden to my family might be too great. And yet, when I really explored that opportunity, there were ways for me to take advantage of it. And to this day, it's one of the moments that I treasure from, from being an undergraduate student and now leading some study abroad courses. Can you talk about how students plan for or think about or finance those sorts of, uh, those sorts of study opportunities? Yeah, so typically if they're studying abroad, their bills pretty much remain the same. They are billed as if they are a student right on campus. Um, the only variations would be with room and board. Um, because depending on where they go to study, uh, they either can pay Juniata for room and board, it's 100% exchange, or they pay their home stay for the room and board. Okay. And then their financial aid, if that is the case, will basically cover them, and we can issue a refund to the students so that they can pay their home stay if they're taking out a loan. Okay. And it's a good way for them. And then we also encourage students to enroll in e-refund so that whenever we do process refunds, it goes direct deposit to their bank account so that they can pay their home stay. Um, so that way it's a quick, easy transaction. That sounds great. <laughs> so, and as Lauren mentioned, 
from the aid aspect, uh, we don't necessarily give additional aid, although there are some scholarships through our international like the Keppel grant, right the Keppel so grant there are some grants um there's the Gilman scholarship um where to start with that process for study abroad is our internet our center for international um, studies they will be able to because they kind of spearhead that part of because we don't always know who's going abroad mm -hmm. um so there are some opportunities for grants and scholarships for that but for the most part, we just treat, as Lauren said, we're treating the students as if they're here. So the aid typically doesn't change. Now, because they do have more expenses, if they, they obviously would need to fly a flight, um, you know, they need to buy airline tickets, we do enable them to borrow more money if they want to borrow more money. Um, we don't necessarily fund them because it isn't a, unless it's it's not a requirement to study abroad, but it gives them the opportunity. They can borrow more money if they choose to, or parents can do that as well. Um, but as Lauren said, we pretty much process it as if they are here, and then that creates a refund, which Lauren sends, and then that's what they use to, to pay either the homestay or to use for funding when they're there. That's great. I mean, it's just so powerful to have access to these kinds of experiences and to know that students aren't, um, you know, excluded from them because, you know, maybe finances have been a concern or continue to be a, a family concern. Are you going to study abroad? Are you planning? We have this conversation <laughs> off, off air a lot. Because <laughs> um, I'm always pushing. Not on air. <laughs> I still don't know. I yeah. Mean, I don't yeah. know. I'm still figuring out. Let me figure out my spring <laughs> schedule. Damn. We have these short-term study abroad opportunities, too. And typically, and, uh, you know, as you said, um, if you are thinking of studying abroad, it, you know, oftentimes that the Center for um, International Studies is where you would start, or your advisors, because if it, or if it's a class, some classes um, that you register for have a trip associated with it so before you register for that class it typically tells you of what the cost would be to go on that trip too yeah. so that it helps you to plan you know you're not blindsided whenever you get a bill that has a fee associated with it right and a lot of times those short-term programs we split those 50 50 between two semesters so that it's not all up front in one semester half spilled in fall half spilled in spring that's really helpful or mm -hmm. spring and summer yeah well, what about uh, external scholarships or assistance or, you know, aid that students continue to generate for themselves to help support their educational experiences? Mm -hmm. uh, where can they maybe find those or how do they report them to financial planning if, if they're received? They are one of the best ways. So we consider outside scholarships anything other than Juniata aid, federal or state aid. Um, and we see a lot of success with, of course, freshmen coming in because during convocation at their um, or commencement at their high school they receive things but current students also can look for additional scholarships I mean you could do a Google search and look for anything but one piece of advice we do give families and students is that if a place asks for you to pay a fee for a scholarship that's mm -hmm. probably something you want to avoid if they're yeah. going to give you money they'll never ask you for money we also have on our Juniata page, though, on the Juniata financial planning page, outside resources um, or additional resources where, because we're often sent emails from outside sources saying, hey, advertise our scholarship on this page. Um, we try to look through them to see if they're legitimate. So the ones we put on there, we feel look as though they're legitimate. Um, and we usually give you, usually there's a link, um, a web link to where um, it takes you to their page and what they would require for you. Um, you know, some of them, there's all different kinds of scholarships depending on some are looking for uh, women in STEM and yeah. some are looking for different areas. So we always encourage students to check out our financial planning webpage um, at genieta.edu under the admission tab. You'll see financial planning. Um, and you can look to see what outside scholarships are there. They often have deadlines, though, so it's important to check the deadlines. Um, if the deadlines pass, then obviously you need to keep looking. We also encourage families and students to look in what we call your own backyard. So a lot of times students get scholarships through affiliations that the family is um, 
affiliated with. So for instance, maybe the family's um, members of the VFW, or maybe they are their church or their religious affiliation has a scholarship. Mm -hmm. Those are things that if you check in your own area, sometimes um, there's scholarships out there that we wouldn't know about, but right. that if you do your own homework, that they, they're out there for you. And I think, you know, faculty and staff also help point students. You know, I advise the National Society for Leadership and Success. They offer some scholarships to, you know, members of the honor, honorary, and, and we have students apply for those and receive those. Mm -hmm. and, you know, Omicron Delta Kappa is another organization, the Point Foundation. And so, you know, I'm constantly sort of pushing out to students, you need to apply for this. You're so tremendous. You need to, you need to put your name in for this. And, uh, and both, I think, helping students find the confidence to do that. I think our students typically are pretty humble. Mm -hmm. um, but to be able to say, yeah, I am pretty awesome. I do, right. <laughs> I right. do deserve that, that money and support uh, is important. So if students are receiving some outreach from faculty, it, it can take, I think, some effort to put those applications in, but there can be some significant benefit to doing that as well. Right. And I, too, am a first-generation college student. My my dad was a coal miner. So that's how I actually afforded uh, college is that I had a scholarship through the United Mine Workers because he was a coal miner who got laid off. So um, I'm living and breathing proof that outside scholarships help you because if I wouldn't have had that scholarship, you know, I probably would have been having to work three jobs while I was still in school. So. Yeah, yeah, it's a blessing. Yeah. Well, uh, FAFSA, we've talked a little bit about the FAFSA the free application for federal student aid, I think. Yep, you got it, yep. <laughs> um, and, you know, that form, it's available, and, and likely many, most families, I hope, filled it out kind of once, but it is something that families have to continue to do to receive aid. And, and for students, I think it's challenging because their scope of uh, authority, as you pointed out, is limited, you know, because that's a family document that has to be submitted and you know students only have so much control or access to it um are there dates or deadlines that it's helpful to know about for fafsa that are coming up mm -hmm. absolutely um, as i mentioned before october 1st you can start doing it now for next year already because it is based on parents and students 2018 taxes which should be done at this point so anytime after october 1st of the year it opens for the next year um, I think a lot of families, and myself included, um, I have a college student freshman myself. Um, I haven't even thought about doing the FAFSA already for next year, but I will soon because yeah. um, then I get too busy. <laughs> but uh, so October 1st or any time after that is when you can do the FAFSA for next year. Um, the other thing to remember is that we recommend the college, we have our own unofficial deadline, which we would like it to be done by April 1st. Okay. So that's, we're saying you can do it after April 1st, but we would really like you to get it done by April 1st. Um, and the reason for that is because there are a lot of states, I know the Pennsylvania state does have a hard deadline of May 1st, so they do not waver on that deadline. So if you are a Pennsylvania resident and you are eligible for the free Pennsylvania state grant, they require the FAFSA to be done before May 1st. If it's not, if it's done May 2nd, you lost that funding for oh, the whole year. And that can be really hard. It can, it can be up to $4,000 of lost free money. So that's where the deadlines really, you know, it has to be a priority because, um, and other states have similar deadlines. You know, you, it depends on the state you live in, so you wanna double check that but most other states have similar like May 1st deadlines. So anywhere between October 1st and I'd say April 1st, that's the best time to get the FAFSA in. I know my dad was always, you know, he was a small business owner and so he was always try trying to balance. We want to get it in fast and we also need time to plan, you know, for tax season and, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, getting ready for that part of it. And so it always felt like a tug of war in our family. Not, right. I mean, there was no, everyone wanted to get it in, but it was sort of like, how quickly could we get it in? Right. Um, well, and, and that's where I think that's one of the reasons they went to prior, prior, or two years back of taxes, because it was to the point where when they were using the real-time taxes, 
small business owners, you know, people who own their businesses had extensions, they couldn't get them done. So that was one of the reasons that we had, the it government has tried to make it easier for families and saying, all right, we're going to use two years past. So that's where the 2018 taxes, which everyone, even if you filed an extension, usually by October, you have to have them in. So you should be able to get them done. And, and I always say, if not, go in there and put, you know, get it in. You know, even if you use some estimates, you can always go back in and update it. It's better to get it in than to just not do it at all. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think one of the challenges about finances and money is it's an invisible conversation in some respects. And I know you have some comfort level around talking about it because that's your work. That's what you do. But for families, you know, particularly where financial stress is an issue and, and family dynamics play into that. And, you know, there's just so many layers and it, it kind of feels like, you know, you're kind of bringing it all to the table in an uncomfortable way. But, um, you know, my sensibility has been for folks who are encountering challenges, it really is best to communicate up front to stay in contact. And, and I found that the college is really willing to work with students and with families to find a way through because, you know, it's a push for a lot of folks and, mm -hmm. and we don't talk about it. it. It seems from the outside, I think mm -hmm. sometimes like, oh, everyone else is, is making it through. No one has any, uh, any challenges, but in reality, you know, it's a stretch for a lot of families. Right, right. And so having those clear open lines of communication is really important. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and from our standpoint, sometimes if we don't hear anything from families, we don't know that you're struggling with it. As, as I mentioned before, if you're having difficulties or even just wrapping your head around the whole process, because I know um, I my parents didn't go to college, so I know that we learned together um, through the process. Like We learned how to do the financial aid together. Um, so if that overwhelms you, because I think that's part of it too, is that it, oh, the whole process just overwhelms families. Yeah, it's like, yeah. I don't know what about, what I'm doing, or I don't want to do something wrong. That's what we're here for. Um, because we do, we deal with it every day. Um, and then I think most families have an overall plan and that's where I go back to the financial aid award letter. We do send that out ahead of time so that you can start thinking of your plan. Um, I think sometimes families though, if you try to look too far ahead, like if you plan four years out, it overwhelms you. I always tell families, just let's plan for this year. Let's let's do this year, and then every year you'll get an award letter, and we'll go from there. You know, every year you can figure out what your best options are, um, because if you try to plan for four years out overall, mm. sometimes that overwhelms families, if, especially if you have limited resources. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Well, I just really appreciate the work that you do with our students, with their families, you know, on behalf of the college and, and helping to make it work because, you know, it, it sort of is one of those things where it takes a village, I think. And, sure uh, and so, you know, um, Lauren's available at bursar at juniata.edu. You know, Tracy and her team are available at financial planning at juniata.edu. We all have phones. Um, we'd love to see your smiling face if you have a chance to drop by campus, but, uh, but really sort of look forward to helping and assisting as, uh, as problems are encountered and, uh, and questions need to be asked. So okay. I thank you for taking the time to Absolutely. be here with us and, uh, and yes. our families. It's been a pleasure to host you again on uh, Thriving at Junietta. And we'll be back on our traditional day, Wednesday, uh, in the week that follows uh, to connect with you more. In the meantime, have a great fall break.